Hello, I greet you in the name of the Sovereign Creator of Heaven and Earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. What we're doing here is starting my ex an exposition of my translation of Acts, it's, uh, taken from the Sovereign Creator Has Spoken, Objective Authority for a Living, second edition. You can download it free from my site, Prunch.org, or buy it from Amazon. It's a translation of my Greek text, the Greek New Testament, according to Family 35. Third edition, you can buy it or download it free also. My normal procedure is to read a paragraph and then go back and make comments. So that's what I will do now with chapter 1 of Acts, verses 1 through 5. The first account I prepared, Theophilus, that's God lover, concerned all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken back after he had given commandment by Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also showed himself alive after his suffering by many convincing evidences, appearing to them during forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being together, he directed them not to go away from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which you heard from me, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with Holy Spirit not many days from now. I want to start with this verse 5, the last half of verse 4. After the promise of the Father, we have quotes. Jesus, this is the way it is in the Greek text. It doesn't come out very well in English, but that's, the way, it's just, it, that's just the way it is in the Greek text. We have a a quote after Father says, which you heard from me, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with Holy Spirit not many days from now. End quote. Okay, to go back, as I translated reading about Theophilus, that means God lover, Luke, who wrote Acts, also addressed the same man, Theophilus, in the Gospel of Luke. And there he adds an honorific, honorable, or excellent. And also in verse 4 of chapter 1 of Luke, it's very clear that uh, Luke was talking to a specific person, a specific man, individual. However, I would like to think that Luke, both the Gospel and this book, are prepared for all true lovers of God. I want to comment now at the end of verse 1, began to do and to teach. Why began? Well, probably because this book <coughs> will relate that what he continued to do and teach through the Apostles. That's what the name of the book is, the Acts of the Apostles. But then, why not today? I say that God is still at work in our world today, using us. Why not? Verse 2, until the day in which he was taken back, taken back, taken back. Jehovah the Son was given to this earth for 33 some years. Then he was taken back. In John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Isaiah 9.6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's precisely correct. The baby that the Virgin Mary produced was... A child, but not the Son. The Son is eternally pre-existent. Um, <laughs> Jehovah the Son made use of that baby's body. But you see, the text is very clear. The Son was given. So while I'm talking about that, <laughs> I really enjoy what uh, John wrote in chapter 12 and 41. I understand that wherever Jehovah appeared in the Old Testament, it was always Jehovah the Son. Notice what John wrote in chapter 12, verse 41. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke to him. And uh, his glory is obviously that it's talking about Jesus in the prior context. And the prior context, he blinded their eyes and what? And that's from exactly Isaiah chapter 6. So John is saying that Isaiah saw Jesus sitting on the throne. Verse 1, it was... Jehovah sitting on the throne, but uh, John says uh, that was Jehovah the Son, that was Jesus. <laughs> I love it. The Son was given. <laughs> Going on, after he had given commandment by Holy Spirit 
to the apostles. There's no definite, de there is no definite article with Holy Spirit, which is why I don't translate it. I think we should get accustomed to thinking of the Holy Spirit as a proper name. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Notice what it says. After he had given commandment by Holy Spirit to the apostles. How does that work? Well, you think of all the, the commands. Matthew 28, the so-called Great Commission. Go into all the world, make disciples. Mark 16, go everywhere and, pre and preach to everyone. Luke 24, 46 to 48. John 20, 21. Like the Father sent me, I'm sending you. The only way... <laughs> The only way that the apostles or, or anyone else or we could obey those commands is with the Holy Spirit's enabling. So, by Holy Spirit, the commandment, but without the Holy Spirit, they were not going to be able to fulfill those commands. Now, it says very plainly here in the third verse that after his resurrection, the Lord Jesus showed himself alive to his followers for 40 days. 40 days, during 40 days. The ascension took place only 40 days after the resurrection. So what was the Lord Jesus doing all that time? Well, he was dealing with his followers, the apostles and other disciples. He was appearing to them and he was talking to them. <laughs> I really wish that we had a record of all that Jesus said during that time, but we have no record absolutely of what, of what the Lord taught those people during that time. I wish we did, but we don't. But obviously, the Lord Jesus was not sitting still during all that time. He was busy during those 40 days. Now, verse 4 says that they were together and that Jesus told them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. In John 14, 31, it's quite clear that everything that Jesus did started with the Father. Luke is here is repeating what he already wrote in Luke 24, verse 49, which in turn refers to John 14, verse 16, and John 14, 26, the Lord there in the upper room explaining about the Comforter and what he would do, because the promise is precisely the Holy Spirit. That's what uh, the Lord quotes himself as having already said, that you heard from me, John baptized with water, you will be baptized with Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the promise was precisely the Holy Spirit. The not many days from now, I'm going to comment about just in a, in a few minutes, a few verses on down. So I think we can go on now. I will now read verses 6 through 8 only, comment there, and then go on to verse 9 when the Lord actually leaves. Okay, verse 6. Well then, being together, they asked him, saying, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? So he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has placed within his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even to the last part of the earth. That was the Lord answering, and that's where his answer stops. That's the last word we have from him before he went back to heaven. Verse 6, being together. This goes back to verse 4. Verse 4 and being together. Verse 6, being together. At this point, you know that after the resurrection, two Sundays they were in the upper, upper room, but then afterwards they went to Galilee. There, Jesus appeared to them various times. In fact, the Great Commission in Matthew was given in Galilee, not in Jerusalem. But obviously, they all came back to Jerusalem in time for Jesus to leave from the Mount of Olives. And they were then to wait there until they got the Holy Spirit. Being together. Now they're in Jerusalem. Now then, those poor disciples... <laughs> all the time before Jesus died, they were waiting for the kingdom. They expected Jesus to start the kingdom, inaugurate the kingdom right then. And they were just in the bottom of despair after Jesus died until he rose again. But now, here is the Messiah. He has been victorious over death. So they are, they are expecting even more now that Jesus will start the, 
the Messianic kingdom. So that's their question. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? Like, what's the problem? <laughs> Where is the kingdom? Now, Jesus does not question the fact implicit in their question, that is, that there ought to be a kingdom. There's going to be one. He simply tells them that the time when it will be started is classified information. That is not for anyone to know, just the Father. At that time, only the Father could know that. But now notice what he says. You will receive, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me. That's probably not the way it is in your Bible. A very small minority of Greek manuscripts, perhaps 2% of inferior quality, read my witnesses instead of witnesses to me. Well, in my mind at least, there is a significant difference in meaning. To be a witness to Jesus involves being like him. Matthew, 28, Matthew 10, verse 25 says that it's enough for a, a disciple to be like his master, a slave to be like his owner. And then doing like him, because in John 14, 12, there in the upper room, Jesus said, those who believe into me will do the things that I do, and they'll do even more. So, if we are witnesses to Jesus today, we should be being like him and doing like him. At least that's the way I see it. At the, the second half of verse 8, we have a strategy. The, the Greek text says precisely both and and, and the effect is that these things are to be done simultaneously. That is to say, Jerusalem, Judea and, Jama Judea and Samaria are treated as a single unit. And then the last part of the earth. We need to emphasize here that the word last is an adjective used as a noun. So we have to supply part or place or whatever, render end. But it is singular. It is not plural. Some, some uh, translations have to the ends of the earth. No, it's the end. I take it, therefore, that the last spot has to be reached. No part of the earth is to be left unreached. That's, that's my reading of it. But let's go back and think about the strategic effect of this. Simultaneously, we have to be working on our Jerusalem, our Judean Samaria, that's our country, that's our city, our country, and the whole world. You may be aware that there's some people who have said that, well, no, 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 no. We have to concentrate on our Jerusalem. After we finish reaching our Jerusalem, then we can worry about, look, <laughs> if you wait until you win everyone in your Jerusalem, you're never going to go anywhere else. <laughs> there, there are people who simply don't want God, and they don't want God, and they're never going to want God. So there are always going to be people that will never be one. And if you're waiting until you win everyone in your town, that's where you're going to. That's where you're going to die. You're never going anywhere else. Fortunately, a lot of people have understood correctly that we had to do everything simultaneously, and so, as a matter of fact, the gospel has gone pretty well around the world. There are some unreached peoples yet. Okay, let's go on and read verses nine through eleven. Upon saying these things, as they watched, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And as they were as they were staring into the sky. While he was going, suddenly two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the sky? This very Jesus who, has, who is being taken up from you into the sky, he will come again in the precise manner that you observed him going into the sky. That's the word of the angels, which I take the two men in white clothing to be. They just all of a sudden they're there, and then they disappear. A mild, just a, a mild curiosity. I wonder if it's the same two that officiated at the empty tomb. Perhaps, perhaps not. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> now, notice in verse 11, the angel said, Men of Galilee. And by the way, it is men. It's, uh, the word refers only to males. Galilee. I... Take it, we are to understand that the only people that were there were the 11 apostles, and all of the original apostles evidently were, as a matter of fact, chosen from Galilee. None from Judea. 
one might consider that to be curious, but on the other hand, when you think about it, the Pharisee types had such a stronghold on Jerusalem society and environs that the text talks about secret believers who that way for fear of the Jews. Remember Joseph of Arimathea, the man who was in charge of, of burying Jesus, his body. He says that he was a believer, but secretly for fear of the Jews. So this stranglehold was a factor throughout Judea, but probably was much less so in Galilee. And there, that's why Jesus chose all his disciples from there. Not only that, your, your, your Judeans tended to look down their spiritual noses at the Galileans because they were right near the temple and the Galileans were far away. Much more important, I think, is what the angel actually says here. This very Jesus who is being taken up from you into the sky, he will come again in the precise manner that you observed him going into the sky. The, the angels are quite emphatic here. They are emphatic. The Lord's return, I take, will be precisely in the same glorified body that he went up. He's going to come back visibly. It'll be from a cloud and his feet will touch down at the same spot where they left. In Matthew 24, verse 30, it says he's going to come on the clouds or in the clouds. You can read that, Matthew 24, verse 30. And in Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 4, his feet are going to touch on the Mount of Olives, and that one I want to read. So let's go to Zechariah 14, verse 4. Malachi is the last book in the New Old Testament, and Zechariah is the next to the last. Zechariah 14, 4, it says, And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And why that large valley? Have you ever wondered about that? If you'll go to Ezekiel 47, I think you'll find the answer. I don't want to take time with that. But if you go and check in Ezekiel 47, there's a, a little stream that comes out from the sanctuary under the, under the door, and it goes running down, and it keeps getting deeper and deeper. First it's up to your ankles, then it's up to your knees, then it's up to your waist, and then you have to swim. But it's going from Jerusalem down to the, down to the Jordan and into the Dead Sea. You see, of course, at the moment that can't happen because between Jerusalem and and the Jordan Valley, there's this huge Mount of Olives. It's a, it's a whole mountain range there. But when Jesus comes back, his feet are going to touch there and that's going to split. It's going to open a, a valley and now that water is going to be able to run straight down. <laughs> Just for the record. Um, but I'm insisting upon what the angel said here. Jesus is going to come back just like he left, and he's going to touch down where he took off, the Mount of Olives. That's what it says. Of course, there are going to be all sorts of other things that accompany Christ's return. But that's not my topic here at the moment. Verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called <coughs> of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. I just want to com comment that Sabbath day's journey. That would be, as generally understood, to have been about a thousand yards or three-fifths of a mile or just under a kilometer. That's from the Mount of Olives down to Jerusalem. So you can understand that when Jesus was buried and then he resurrected and the guy, people are moving back and forth, the distance was really very short. If from up on top of the Mount of Olives down to Jerusalem, the city was about a kilometer, well then... Within the city and in environs, it was really much less. Uh, Jerusalem was not all that big of a city in those days. Okay, let's go on to, I'll read 13 and 14 before going on with uh, replacement for Judas. 